Peace, everyone. Welcome to African Esquire TV. I am Tani Cherie, and we have a special guest. We have a few special guests today, as you see. Um, brother Abe Obi Buna Jr. is joining us. Both of us are um, tending to our children, so it's going to be an interesting interview. But that's mm -hmm. all good because that's a part of the revolution, right? So yes, it is. Uh, yes, it is. So <laughs> we're going to be talking about a number of and and, and men yeah. and men can do this too. Exactly. <laughs> give, the, give, give the brothers out there their props who do it. Exactly. Absolutely. So we have a number of great things to talk about. Brother Obi's mm -hmm. always busy, always um, working, always organizing. So he's going to uh, bring us up to speed. So Brother Obi, um, you've been on my channel a few times. But for those who have not uh, had the pleasure of seeing her, great interview, can you give us a little bit about uh, who you are, what you do? Um. My name is Obi Egbuna Jr. I'm a journalist. I'm an African history teacher, children K through 12, and I'm a children's playwright. Always through organizational and institutional vehicles, though. We're movement builders, not brand builders. We're traditional in our approach. So on the theatrical side of things, I'm a co-founder of the Mass Emphasis Children's in, in History Theater Company, based in Washington, D.C. 25 plays to our credit, 21 have been performed since 2011. This is our 10th anniversary. I'm the U.S. correspondent to the Herald, Zimbabwe's national newspaper, the first in the history of the country to have that. And I, we consider that a responsibility, not a distinction. We're also new to a new newspaper, the U.S. correspondent to the Southern African Times, a newspaper based out of London, an online one. Check that out when you can. And I'm the external relations officer of the Zimbabwe-Cuba Friendship Association, the first person to ever have that challenge in the history of that organization. And that organization's function is to maintain people-to-people -people relations between the peoples of Zimbabwe and the peoples of Cuba. And at the moment, I am negotiating to become a special assistant to the president of the African Heritage Studies Association, special advisor to the president on special projects and African and global affairs. So that's not finalized yet, but the conversations have began and hopefully that goes well. And so that's, and, and also in addition to mass emphasis, we have the Mass Emphasis Positive Action and Creativity Youth Brigade, where we identify the talents of the young people, if they're photographers, if they're singers, if they're dancers, if they're painters, if they're sculptors, and we attempt to do projects centered around their talents and their skill sets, which reinforces that the human resource is the most precious of all, and utilizing the human resource will ultimately determine what we do with the material resources that are inherently ours when we get organized to reclaim them and control them and share them with everybody who has a right to have access to them. So in a nutshell, that's who I am. I'm 52 years old. I've been organizing for 31 years now and don't plan to stop anytime soon to the last drop of air to the last drop of blood. That's awesome. Um, and I see a comment that goes directly to Cuba, um, obviously Cuba right now is dealing with a number of challenges from the United States trying to once again, um, or continually trying really to push a regime change in that country. Someone made an interesting comment. They said I had to uh, cancel my trip to Cuba because of anxiety of potential rise of colonial viruses and its variants. Um, you know, a lot of propaganda going on around uh, right now. What can you tell us about the current? <laughs> Um, well, as usual, we will do it in the context of the work we do. So first of all, I want to thank you for assisting with the historic press conference that we had for the Cuban ambassador to the United Nations, His Excellency Luis Pedroso Cuesta, a, a Cuban-born African who, as you know by seeing him, Sister Tierney, could pass for a relative of Bernie Mac and Robin Harris in terms of his features. So all this about they don't empower Africans, but the face of their nation is representing them at the United Nations, the highest diplomatic platform in the world. 
And prior to that, he'd come there from Geneva, where he was representing them. At a moment in history where they have three African vice presidents, for those of you who didn't know, three African vice presidents serving at the pleasure of His Excellency Miguel Diaz Canal. And they, they are part of a revolutionary process. They're not glorified runner ups like Kamala Harris. So we wanna thank you for helping organize the press conference that we had in July for him, where the follow-up to that press conference is supposed to be a sit down before the end of this year or beginning of next year with Prince of Latina, their national media outlet for the purpose of creating a press corps in support of their revolution that will exist in the diaspora. And as you know, we had press out of Germany there, press out of Iran there, the Pacifica radio community was well represented, podcasts like yours. Um, shout out to Dr. James Pope and Dr. Um, Brother Kaba Akintunde for getting WPFW in Washington to air it live. KPFK in LA was there, KPFT in Houston was there, WBAI in New York was there. Um, Dr. Wilma Leon from Sirius Radio was there. We were well represented. Press from Ghana was there, press from Denmark was there, press from London was there. The final call, shout out to their West Coast representative, Sister Charlene Muhammad, their Washington Bureau correspondent, Nisa Islam Muhammad was there. Their DC uh, desk reporter, Brian, Mah I mean, their um, East Coast desk reporter on international affairs, Brian Muhammad was there. So that was beautiful. And uh, so we did that. And um, then what we've been working on lately that just came out a week and a half ago, and thank you so much, Sister Tierney, for your assistance in that. But we did something, a document called a call for restitution, repair and redemption for the Cuban people in defense of their homeland and sovereignty. And what we are calling for is for the last few years, Cuba has let it be known that they are seeking restitution slash reparations for the damages of the blockade, which automatically um, modernizes and expands the question of reparations. And we were so happy to have in COBRA sign off, the Malcolm X grassroots movement sign off, the New African People's Organization, Asada Shakur's organization sign off. Thanks to you, the National Conference of Black Lawyers signed off. So it was very strategic to make sure that they were involved. Osajefo, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's daughter, the president of the Kwame Nkrumah Pan-African Center in Ghana signed off. Um, Nine Cuban Friendship Associations in the Caribbean, in Grenada, in Kirkau, in Jamaica, in Guyana, in Trinidad and Tobago um, signed off. Nine of them, the South African Cuban Friendship Association signed off on this. The December 12th movement signed off on this. The Universal African American People's Organization signed off on this. And our demands, number one, $147 billion in damages because of that's what the chaos, they based on their calculations, and those are their calculations. We didn't come up with that number. We're political organizers. We're not mathematicians. We don't do analytics. They came up with that because some people were raising that question. So just so the record would be cleared. And of course, like everyone else, we're calling for the lifting of the blockade, but to call for the lifting of the blockade and not have an action plan to go with it would have been like saying segregation was abominable in Montgomery in 1955, but not being part of organizing a bus boycott or saying that apartheid and settler colonialism in Southern Africa was deplorable, but not assisting ZANU and ZAPU, not assisting Free Limo, not assisting SWAPO, not assisting ANC, PAC and ZAPO, not assisting MPLA. So we wanted to make sure that it was tied to something with action related. We're, and when we're saying the compensation takes place, not only must the, must the United States government, the Senate, the White House and Congress, they're not only culpable, but we're saying that all these imperialist presidents who have gone on to their second career to masquerade as born again humanitarians. So that's the Obama Foundation, the Bush Foundation, the Carter Center and the rest of them. So they're culpable as well. And then we, um, to take it out of the United States context, because um, Cuba, it's not, it's not exclusively about that. We're saying that CARICOM, and that is the umbrella for your listeners that don't know that all the Caribbean nations belong to, 
Cuba for all these years has never had permanent status in CARICOM, just observer status, which suggests that Cuba is not part of CARICOM. To suggest, to imply, to affirm that Cuba is not part of CARICOM is the equivalent of saying that Egypt slash Kemet or Morocco or Algeria or Libya or any part of Northern Africa because of the Arab presence is not really part of the African continent. And unfortunately, some of us based on colonialist and imperialist propaganda accept that narrative. It's, it's that ridiculous, it's that ignorant. So we're calling on CARICOM who has had conferences with Cuba, who has trade relations with Cuba, but the final thing would be to give them that permanent status. On the African continent side, it maybe this is a knee-jerk reaction since this is the 20th anniversary of the United Nations Conference on Racism, Xenophobia, and Other Related Intolerances. So our community is raising Cain or hell about Zionist Israel having observer status of the African Union. And of course, we embrace the sentiment. But with that being said, that's just a step in the right direction because they had it under the Organization of African Unity. Not much was said about it. And not only that, if they are stripped of this status that they never deserved, that they never earned, but we don't do anything about the fact that 46 of the 55 African nations have diplomatic relations with is Zionist Israel at the moment. 46 Israeli embassies on the African continent. If we're not doing anything about that, then when I grew up in Washington, D.C., we used to slap box. That's slap boxing at a time where we need to ball our fist up and throw the most efficient and most damaging punches to Zionist Israel as possible. And the fact that Zionist Israel is the only other nation at this moment in history that feels that the blockade against Cuba should be maintained, which shows you that Western propaganda hasn't been fair to Adolf Hitler. They've left him by his lonesome when vilifying him. We're saying that make room for Golda Meir to be next to him, make room for Menachem Begin to be next to him, make room for David Ben-Gurion to be next to him, make room for Abba Iban to be next to him, to Yitzhak Rabin, Yitzhak Shamir, every member of the Labor and Likud party representing the foundation of the Zionist state of Israel to be next to them. And as a matter of fact, the fact that Israel, when Israel supports the blockade on Cuba, which is an extension of Israel voting against self-determination for Algeria, voting against self-determination for Tunisia, aiding the German colonialist in Namibia, aiding the Portuguese colonialist in Mozambique and Angola, aiding the British colonialist in, um, and Dutch colonialist in what's called South Africa and Zimbabwe and Zambia. We're saying that Adolf Hitler couldn't have been prouder of you. Because when you take a look at the role of Germany in the Berlin Conference, it was there. That was the planning, six months of planning. And what Israel has done since the Zionist movement was created 12 years after that, it lets you know everything that you need to know. And the fact that you have another tie, the fact that Joe Biden has shown you he has no interest at all in being your white liberal fairy godfather. No, he doesn't want to imitate JFK. No, he doesn't want to imitate FDR. No, he doesn't want to imitate LBJ. No, he doesn't want to imitate WJC, William Jefferson Clinton, in case you missed that. Nor does he want to impersonate BHO, his former um, a subordinate, Barack Obama, when he was the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and Obama was the youngest member, the, the lowest ranking member. So the fact that that went on, and he's telling you that he doesn't want to be anything like your usual white liberal, but he prefers to be the extension of Harry Truman, Truman who brought Zionist Israel into existence, Truman who brought the CIA into existence, Truman who made a decision to desegregate the military seven years after that was the main demand of Bayard Rustin and A. Philip Randolph when the March on Washington was originally called in 1941. So that's who Biden prefers to be like. Truman who dropped the hydrogen bomb. 
So he prefers to be that type of Democrat. Truman, who said Africa wasn't ready to be on its own. It still needed to be, it was better off under colonial rule when his reelection was three years after the fifth Pan-African Congress. So when you take all of this into consideration, that's where Biden is. And so this is why we're saying that Cuba should replace Zionist Israel at the African Union and observe in that observing capacity based on the fact they got 4,000 doctors dispersed throughout Africa now that not only treat the sick, but are training the, ch the ch children that are aspiring to be doctors who will stay in their nations no matter what the challenges are. They're not coming to Washington. They're not coming to Paris. They're not coming to Germany. They're not coming to London. They're staying put in their homeland to give their people the best medical representation they've ever had. They're responsible for Zimbabwe's 97% literacy rate because between 1986 and 1996, 3,000 of them were trained in, in Cuba. And they were the backbone, of, they're the backbone of the educational system in Zimbabwe. You know about their willingness to die side by side with us in the Congo after Lumumba was slaughtered and butchered. You know they stood shoulder to shoulder with us in Guinea-Bissau and Mozambique and Angola. So their track record in terms of the African continent, you saw what they did in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea five and a half years ago during the Ebola pandemic. So based on that, they're the ones more deserving of the status. Bringing it back to the United States, we are calling on the Congressional Black Caucus, the National Conference of Black State Legislators, who are usually overlooked, and there are 7,000 of them, sisters and brothers, the National Conference of Black Mayors and the African American Mayoral Association to start sending delegations to Cuba to look at the damages the blockade has caused. I do and, I want to get like get specifically into that point though, because I don't want people to miss it. The difference between just calling to end the blockade and actually pushing for reparations, to me, very different um, stances to take. Uh, mm -hmm. Why do we need to be saying reparations and not just ending the blockade? Because, number one, any authentic call for reparations, but we're saying restitution, but any authentic call for restitution cannot deal with the damages and atrocities committed during our physical displacement and kidnapping, commonly referred to as chattel slavery, in isolation from what has gone on during colonialism, during the settler colonial era and the neo-colonial era and the annexation era. And taking into consideration that the first seven presidents of the United States wanted to annex Cuba. Cuba is supposed to be like Puerto Rico, supposed to be like Guam, supposed to be like the U.S. Virgin Islands if they had their way. All the damages the blockade has caused. Yes. And we, you know, Sister Tyranny, we don't put premium on human suffering. It's not a calculator in existence that could come up with a figure that would satisfy those of us who have an appetite for power. But this is about making sure the resources go towards the maintenance of a revolutionary process. The healthcare system that has created its own vaccine manufacturer during the corona pandemic would be the recipient. The effort, many people feel they will be the country to find a cure to cancer. Many people feel they will be the country to find a permanent cure to HIV AIDS. It is already established that they have the most advanced gerontology program in the Americas. That is to treat the elderly, in case you guys didn't know what that meant, some of you. Um, the fact that they are on the verge of eradicating blindness in the Americas through the in incredible program in conjunction with Venezuela, Operation Project Miracle, that's where the resources would go that they're calling for. Their educational system, the highest literacy rate in the world, like we said, look, they position Zimbabwe. And at a moment where in the United States, their most vicious, their most hateful, their most vindictive enemy, 1.7 million children drop out on an annual basis. That's 7,000 children a year. And since Africans are 10% of that demographic, 10.5%, that's close to... Um, the figure says it all, right? In terms of what, what that means in, in representation us, that's like 350,000 children a year that drop out that look like us. No, my fault, like 150,000 children a year that look like us. So the fact that you're, we're fighting to keep HBCUs open, we're fighting to keep African independent schools open, which we'll talk about later, 
it becomes a natural gravitational pull that takes place that makes us want to embrace them. So by them and going to Durban like they did when Colin Powell was being used as a guinea pig to tone down the militancy of Africans who were appalled that the Bush administration said if Palestine was on the agenda, if reparations was on the agenda, if our kidnapping and displacement was on the agenda 20 years ago, they would boycott the meeting. And the fact that Comandante Fidel Castro, the modern day John Brown, walked into Durban and gave the best speech of the conference and said that the whole Americas owes reparations to the African as part of its debt to Africa. So the fact that he modernized it, he expanded it, he pan-Americanized, helped pan-Americanize the call, he helped pan-Africanize the call, and he helped modernize the call. So if Sir Hillary Beckles and Ralph Gonsalves, the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, have a case for reparations dealing with our displacement and dealing with um, our kidnapping, but that's not tied into calling for restitution for the Cuban revolution, for the damages that the blockade has caused, then that means that that's an incomplete call. That means that it's a suggestion that there's a lack of courage or a lack of vision. So what we wanted to do this summer was to make sure that we made sure that that bank, that gap was perfectly filled in. And with nine Caribbean Cuba Friendship Associations, the Zimbabwe Cuba Friendship Association, the South African Cuba Friendship Association, key nationalist organizations, part of that, thanks to you young people in Zambia, young people in Ghana, young people in Guinea, the son of Kwame Touré, his oldest, Bukar Touré, through an organization he started in Guinea, the Pan-African Council, he's on. And for those of you who don't know why we felt so happy that our sister Samia in Kruma signed on to this. If you know your history, Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah was the first one, the head of state, to come out in support of the Cuban revolution and recognition of it, followed by Gamal Abdul Nasser of Egypt slash Kemet. So this goes beyond quoting Kwame Ture when it's convenient, quoting Brother Malcolm when it's convenient, wearing Thomas Sankara shirts to make a fashion statement, what we'd rather do is continue to work that they left behind. And that's exactly what this represents. So it's about not just reparations and restitution. And even those of you, we're in that mood today, Tierney. So even those of you who are angry that reparations blossomed and took off and now has a Pan-American and Pan-African character, you wanted to just strictly deal with North America. When the blockade on Cuba is lifted, you should be at the forefront of sending children out of Detroit, out of Baltimore, out of Chicago, out of Alabama, out of Mississippi, out of New Jersey to the Latin American School of Medical Sciences so they can come back to your communities and be the best doctors you've ever had. So we'll play plantation love with you just to accomplish these objectives. So if you wanna create a silly narrative if you want to make a spectacle of yourself and cause confusion at a moment where we need complete clarity, we'll play along with you. So if you want to go ahead and discredit this for that reason, what we're telling you is stand with us and we'll make sure that as many young people based in the United States that are going to stay in the United States, but they're going to get the training from Cuba and to speak the language of uh, the wokesters, because, you know, um, as Bilal, the African, is credited with the miracle of translating the Quran because Prophet Muhammad was um, functionally literate. As they say, Jesus turned water to wine. Sister Tyranny, our miracle is going to be we're going to turn the wokesters into insomniacs. You know what I'm saying? And the reason that we're going to do that is because um, they were they were um, napping and hibernating from 2008 to 2016. And then Donald Trump got them out of their slumber. And now since Biden won the elections, they're napping again. So this time we'll get you up and we'll make sure that you never even doze off and take a nap again. In the context of this, you're going to stay on the battlefield. You're not going to be a jack in the box when an election is approaching and make a spectacle of yourself with all that political showboating. So we can show you better than we could tell you. So we're going to take the challenge of turning the wokesters into insomniacs. How about that? And they'll never nap again. They won't even snore. None of that.
better than any bur better than any um, alarm clock could do. So what we're saying here is for those of you who don't care about anything outside of North America, come and talk to us and we can make sure that you accept the responsibility of getting as many young people to medical school in Cuba so they can come back and get in front of the non-communicable diseases sending us to the cemetery, get in front of the cancer, get in front of the diabetes, get in front of the strokes, get in front of the heart attacks, get in front of the corona. There's a role for you in this too, as narrow and silly as you might be. So that's what we're here to deal with today. So yes, so yes, it's a brilliant um, strategy that Cuba came up with to mention the figure, because like I said, we don't put a premium on suffering. Um, you can't pay a family enough when you kill their child in cold blood. You can't pay someone that you wrongfully imprisoned for decades enough. None of that. But what we are saying is you know that these resources are going towards a revolution. These resources aren't going to a car dealer. These resources aren't going to Jay-Z and Beyonce, courtesy of Tiffany and company. These resources will not go towards the real estate market of people who don't care whether you're homeless and what have you, but all of a sudden they'd like to exploit your newfound wealth and your newfound fortune. We got a different definition of wealth than you anyway. We take the France Fanon definition. Wealth is not the fruit of labor, but the result of organized protected robbery. The imperialists and colonialists want to protect what they have stolen, and we're ready to put our lives on the line to reclaim it back. So that's what this whole re call for restitution, repair, and redemption for Cuba is. So that's what it's all about. So we just wanted to clear that up. We went down to we went down the objectives pretty thoroughly. What we what we're seeking. There's a CARICOM dimension. There's an African Union dimension. There's a local dimension, and there's a national dimension. And if you doubt it you can look at the organizations that signed on to it. And once again, thank you, Sister Ch Tierney, for your facilitation in that process through your capacity in, as a journalist with the show and the We Charge Colonialism Initiative, because they are married to each other and we're not divorcing no time soon. Thank you. Absolutely. So um, I'm sure many people um, may have been surprised that earlier this year you participated in a panel discussion with uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, I haven't heard a lot from that organization since then. They took a stance on Cuba. Everyone was surprised about that, I think. Um, our people, most people were surprised about that. Um, and there was a program and then um, there hasn't been a lot that we've seen since then. Could you tell us uh, what uh, has happened since that program? Wow, you you get the exclusive. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, now we're, we're products ideologically strategically and tactically of people like Kwame Ture and Mukasa Dada and Bamboshi Shango and Bob Brown, not as well known as the first two, but very skilled, very dedicated organizers. And they introduced us to, along with my dad, been reading Sekou Ture since I was a teenager. And one of the uh, his dictums that jumped off, as he said, the job of the most committed revolutionaries is to make even reactionaries work for the revolution. This is not to suggest that Black Lives Matter are reactionaries, but basically it's making you, challenging you to look at the full spectrum of thought and activity in our community, from the left all the way to the right all the way. And many people have attempted to treat the spectrum like artists treat paintings. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I'll paint it the way I want. It doesn't, and this is, a microcosm of the sentiment that we shouldn't treat social science with the same courtesy that we treat natural science, okay? So what ends up happening is you decide who you want to put on the left. You decide who you want to put on the right. And some of you will tell us with a straight face that Bernie Sanders is on the left. Some of you will tell us with a straight face that Biden, before he was elected, was on the left. Some of you have said Obama is on the left. The Clintons are on the left. And the only thing left about any of them, now you're no longer talking politics, you're talking anatomy. Because if you're not talking about their left elbow or their left kneecap or their left ankle or their left toe, big toe, 
nothing left about any of them, all conquer, all embracing the culture of domination and rape and plunder and repression and genocide. And once you walk that path, you can never make the affirmative statement that you are, represent the left at all. So wanting to deal with that. So we have a young, you know, um, we're at that age, 52, around the same age that Brother Kwame was when we were spending a lot of quality time engaging him. So we're obligated to do, do that with young people like yourself. So strong young brother out of South Bend, Indiana. South Bend got more than Notre Dame. If y'all doubt it, go down there one day. Got some hood down there for you. So a brother named Jordan Geiger, very strong, committed young man. We talk often, and he told me that he was becoming frustrated with Black Lives Matter. What do I think he could do to push them to do something that nobody would expect them to do? And so I tell him, well, because of their connections to Harry Belafonte, their connections to Angela Davis, brother, you might be able to push for them to come out against the blockade on Cuba. And not too long after that, he calls me excited and he said that they did it. Now, put that in the context of what I said earlier. Black Lives Matter in 2021 coming out against the blockade on Cuba. 99% of neo-colonialist Africa has done that. The Vatican in the 1990s has done that. So to say that you're against the blockade on Cuba, when you look at the fact that only two nations on the world stage want to maintain it, you're stating the obvious. It wouldn't be considered militant. It wouldn't be considered courageous. It would be considered logical. So they arrived at a logical conclusion. And then they decided to have a teaching. So we introduced them to attorney Bill Martinez. And everybody that does Cuban solidarity work knows Mr. Martinez, Attorney Martinez. He facilitates the licenses for Cuban artists who come here to perform. So you've got a chance to see Chucho Valdez and artists like that, um, Nachito Herrera and Deremir Ramirez because of the work of Mr. Um, Martinez. So he... We introduced them to him and we felt they'd be comfortable with him because of the way he works, the way he maneuvers. So they come up with a teaching. And so one of the most traveled individuals to Cuba is someone who worked at the Smithsonian for many years named James Early, who's often seen in the company of Danny Glover. So they decided he would be one of the MCs of the program. So the Malcolm X grassroots movement, because of the Assad Shakur connection, they were there. Because we were in the backdrop of everything, uh, representing the Zimbabwe Cuba Friendship Association, they figured we should be there. And then they invited some um, organizers of African ancestry from Cuba. The young lady that's done the amazing Belly of the Beast documentary, she was there, our sister Liz, Nancy Motorhorn, and one of the legends in terms of organizing in the African community, they were there. But because between the press conference and their teaching, you had these regime change demonstrations in Cuba, pushed by the United States Agency for International Development, pushed by the State Department, pushed by the racist chairman of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, um, Bob Menendez out of New Jersey, understanding the Asada Shakur connection to New Jersey. So maybe they had a knee jerk reaction. So they got another African who, who plays both sides of the fence. A few days before this teaching, we were doing something with the local UNIA branch in DC. Shout out to the UNIA African Communities League, Brother Mosi, Brother Congo, uh, Moriama, Oduno, others who we worked with for a very long time. So we talked, and James Early was on the panel, and we told a joke. We said, we, we forced uh, Brother Jordan, we bent his arm to make him come out and push them to come out. Now, we were saying that in the context of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee for one and a half, a year and a half, forcing Dr. King to look at the contradiction of saying be nonviolent in Mississippi, be nonviolent in Alabama, be nonviolent in the Carolinas, but he hadn't said anything about being nonviolent in Vietnam. 
So in that context, we made the joke. So evidently some people in the leadership didn't like the joke. So, and they acted like they couldn't tell that was a joke. We're organizers. We leave the comedy to Dave Chappelle. He got that covered. So that isn't what we were doing. So as many people saw the teaching, they were trying to prevent us from talking, even though they invited us. They kept bumping our slot. But unfortunately, the way things happened, we ended up closing. So you have an idea what happened. So we're just going to go over real quickly what we said. We said, first of all, when... The Cuban diplomats, whether they're in Washington, whether they're in New York, engage U.S. politicians. They, based on the history, 635 assassination attempts on the life of Comandante Fidel Castro, financing the Cuban American National Foundation in 1983, arming terrorist organizations like Brothers to the Rescue and Alpha 66. We said... Cuba's got to be as comfortable in the company of U.S. government officials as a child in a room full of pedophiles. We said it, so what? Then we said what we are tired of is when it comes to Spanish-speaking Africans, all of a sudden we want to overindulge in anthropology when analyzing them, be they in Cuba, be they in Colombia, be they in Venezuela, be they in Nicaragua, it doesn't matter. For some reason, our analysis of them is often too often sounds like a National Geographic episode. This is how fast they run. These are the shoes they wear. This is the food they eat. This is the music they listen to. And when it comes to what they call Afro-Cubans, we don't give a damn about any of that. We want to know if they are on the side of the revolution or are on they the side of regime change. Anytime we look at Africans anywhere at home and abroad, we make an ideological distinction. It's suicidal not to. Mobutu and Lumumba are Congolese. Mobutu was a CIA stooge, the scum of the earth. Patrice Lumumba is one of the most beautiful African revolutionaries our revolution has produced. How do you lump them in together with not, without an ideological distinction? The Africans that fought in Kenya on the side of the Land and Freedom Army, affectionately known as the Mau Mau, they're golden to us. They'll always have a soft spot in our heart. The confused Kenyans who fought on the side of the King's African Rifles, the British King's African Rifles, to maintain colonialism, they represent the worst of us. The Africans who fought with UNITA, the CIA-trained mercenaries, represent the worst of us. Augustino Nito, Jose Eduardo Dos Santos, and the Africans who fought with MPLA, they represent the best of us. Dr. Martin Luther King, if we woke up tomorrow and every African that practices Christianity was like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., oh, how excited we would be. Some of us would even convert to Christianity. That's how we feel about Dr. King. But then you have someone like Reverend Joseph Jackson, who was the, high, the longest reigning president of the National Baptist Convention, who sabotaged King's push to be the leader of that organization, went on a national tour saying that the churches should pursue civil and human rights through law and order, not civil disobedience, telling churches not to join the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. One is a true Christian, one is a devil in the disguise of a man of God. Um, Brother Malcolm, Se Akme Sekuture, Akme Ben Bella, Muammar Gaddafi are the type of Muslims we embrace. All pray the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, freedom fighting Muslims. But you have people like Imam Wardeen Muhammad, who started out like his father, but before he died, he was the number one recruiter in the Muslim community in the U.S. for the U.S. military and for the FBI. You can't, and even so, they have the same spiritual makeup, but there's an ideological distinction there. So, what we were saying was when it comes to the Cuban born Africans, commonly referred to as African Cubans, I can't lump in Antonio Maceo, the bronze titan who the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey named the first Black Star Line ship after. You can't lump him in with Lars Alonso. You can't lump him in with Guillermo Riegendau. You can't lump him in with El Duce. You can't lump him in with Carlos Moore. 
These are pigs. These are reactionaries. These are the doormats of imperialism being used to bring about a regime change in Cuba. We embrace the Africans like Harry Palombo Villegas, who fought with Che on Bolivia and made it out safe. We identify with um, Armando Mendez, the first African to go to space in the Americas. It wasn't Mae Jameson. Unless you have an, unless you embrace the amputated narrative of the African experience, like some of us are doing, because it's fashionable at the moment, we embrace Nicholas Guillen, the African who was the point of their revolution, who Sonia Sanchez calls the Langston Hughes of Cuba. So this is what we're saying. That's what we embrace, and we make that distinction. So the and so what happened is a gentleman named Paulo Herrera, from what we were told, he called up Black Lives Matter, and he said my comments were disgusting and repulsive and the most hurtful comments ever made about Afro-Cubans. And I would have talked about his mother if I knew he felt that way because regime change agents should never get any sympathy from us. To, to support regime change agents is to defend the Africans who were running next to the plantation owners when we were on the Underground Railroad with a net running besides them, running faster than the horse saying, come get them, boss, they over here. We don't support that. Colin Powell just died and some of you cried for him like you lost your father or lost your mother. Our tears are for Maurice Bishop, who he assassinated. Our tears are for Hannah Gaddafi, the two-year-old baby who that coward assassinated. Our tears are for the Vietnamese people whose slaughter he tried to cover up with the Malay massacre. Out, out, out tears are for the Africans in Panama, who he slaughtered when he came up with the thing, the idea of an initiative called Operation Just Cause. So we're clear on where we stand. So if we take that stand anywhere African people are, why would we make this exception in Cuba? So any African in Cuba that is a regime change agent, may they go down with imperialism. It's always been that way, and it's always going to be that way. So what Black Lives Matter decided to do is use our comments, which we're proud of, as an excuse not to make the video publicly. And trust me, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure if the ancestors call us home tomorrow, being in a, a five, speaking for five minutes at a Black Lives Matter teaching is not how we're going to be remembered by our people. I'm very confident of that. So, but what we are saying to them is have the integrity, have the decency to send a video to Cuba, since you say they're your comrades and they're your friends, so you can use it. So what we're asking all the listeners to do who are listening to this, the woman's name who is the head of their international division, her name, and she's a woman of the cloth, mind you. So she's supposed to do the decent thing. She's supposed to do the Christian thing. She's supposed to do the right thing. Her name is Reverend Carlene Griffith Sekou. Hit up Black Lives Matter, all the leadership you know, and tell them to tell her to send that video to Cuba. And they were planning from what Brother Jordan told me, they were going to put the video out with my part edited from it. Based on what I just said, everything I said that night, you heard it, Sister Tyranny, it's everything that I just said on your show. And they're saying that they couldn't stand by those statements. But you know what, though? There are different levels of commitment. There are different levels of resistance. Even though I've never embraced the narrative, I'm hip to what casual resistance is. I know about radical moderates. I know about people who don't want to turn our resistance all the way up. And we're looking for a moment in history where they could make casual resistance fashionable, casual resistance um, acceptable, political uncertainty acceptable. So in hindsight, since they weren't willing to go all the way with the fight to lift the blockade on Cuba, maybe it's the best thing for everybody that they stepped away, because this is one of those things that warriors deal with. Those who embrace the fighting African fighting spirit like you're embracing your beautiful child. It's got to be on that level. You can't play with this. So if it's just about having a mantra or a slogan on a coffee mug or a Frisbee or having people in Hollywood wear your hoodies and pullovers and it's just about making noise during a U.S. presidential election, then go ahead and be, do what makes you comfortable. But when you come around us, to deal with issues that we're committed to, 
to labor that we've demonstrated we're committed to by deed and service for people who believe in executing the idea if not don't even bother articulating the idea when you come on this side act accordingly and if it's not in your makeup then stay in your lane as the young people say all right so you heard brother obi so let's talk about howard university um Right now, there's been some protests happening over there about conditions of dorms. You are a Howard alumni, as many. No, people. you're not. Mm -mm. Oh, I always I'm think you are. I'm a. I'm a. No, my father got his PhD from there. Oh, okay. Dr. Greg Car Dr. Greg Carr teases me and says I grew up on the campus. I was in Howard University Children's Theater when I was nine years old. I was okay. in up. I was in Upward Bound. I've 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 been on that campus most of my life. Okay. I, I went there for a hot second when I got out of high school, but I'm a proud graduate of UDC. But a lot of our political organizing, because I came out of an umbrella organization called the United Pan African Front, and how which university student organizations were part of it: American University students, Catholic University students. Trinity University students, George Washington University students were all part of it. So because we spent a lot of time up there, it was assumed that I go to Howard. But no, 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 no. So it was always just a place to organize. And um, as a matter of fact, when we organized um, an event called Peace Productions, where we boycotted Virginia Beach after the National Guard viciously assaulted um, defenseless African students, just down there to have a good time Labor Day weekend in 1989, the demonstration and boycott almost was stopped because UDC student leadership and Howard student, um, student leadership couldn't get their heads together. And we were the referee and said, riding for Howard on this level, riding for UDC this level is like captives defending their plantation. We're only in these schools to learn as much as we can about the resistance for the purpose of waging the, the highest level of quality resistance. So we, so that's that's how we feel about all the HBCUs. We want to bring, we want to make J. Edgar Hoover's worst nightmare come true. Turn those places into training grounds for African resistance, which is another one of the miracles we want to perform. Number one make the wokesters insomniacs and number two transform the island of black excellence in, into a training ground for african resistance and for people who can't hang with that one-way tickets to zamunda and wakanda call it a day but that's the goal right now so um yes so we watched up we watched the protest very carefully and people have been asking us about it so we'll share how we feel um congratulations to those 18 year olds because dealing with housing conditions puts you right in line with the global fight for sustainable development goals. There are 17 of them, but housing is a very important one. Um, at a moment in history where African people are 43% of the homeless in the United States, even though we're 12% of the population, by taking that stand, you identified with them. By dealing with rats and roaches on your campuses, which you brought attention to, and leakages of sewers, everybody that lives in the projects and housing units all over the United States, everybody that lives in slum conditions in the United States, people who still live in outhouses in the United States, they could identify with you, and you made them proud. And we're proud of you for doing that, especially at the age of 18, 19, who, who many of them were. But at the same time, we can go one or two ways with this, we can run around like some people have already started doing and critiquing the demonstration, criticizing the generation, being an opportunist scumbag under the guise of constructive criticism. You can have people who do that. And we know many are going to leap at that opportunity because it's just in their nature. That's just how they roll. Or we can challenge the students. Let's take it back to three years ago when they had another protest dealing with administrative corruption called Operation H.U. Resist. And one of the students who I met, a young man named Juan McFarland, shout out to the brother if he's watching this, we were talking about one the students taking a bed sheet, I believe it was, writing Kwame Ture's name on it and putting it over Mordecai Johnson's name on it, the most well-known, most decorated president in the history of Howard. 
So when I met the young brother Juan at African Liberation Day, I said, based on that expression, based on that sentiment, brother, the next demonstration going to be down the street? He said, down the street. I say, yeah, because down the street from Howard University's administration building, for those of you who may not know the Howard University landscape, lies a building called the Ralph Bunch Policy Center. And I'm telling you, what goes on there is more filthier than all the rats and roaches in Washington, D.C. Um, there, the United States Agency for International Development lurks like the snake that it is. There, the late Charles Rangel made an arrangement with the HBCU community saying that um, there's a disparity in public policy and Africans need to get in on that. So that means more Franklin Williams, and so, uh, who was Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's classmate, but was the U.S. ambassador to Ghana, and says he had nothing to, he didn't know anything about the coup. So either he was stupid or powerless and they didn't respect him. More Condoleezza Rice's, more Susan Rice's, more Johnny Carson's, that type of thing. That's what they're training. That's what they're preparing the students for. If you look at the African Studies Department at Howard, the Pentagon's influence is all over it. And I told Brother Juan, in case you didn't know, and some of your listeners don't know, Brother Kwame chose Howard University because when he was visiting, he saw the students protesting the House of Un-American Activities Committee, who he said he hated as a child because of what they did to Paul Robeson. So the fact that Howard University, and if you see Howard University's shuttle bus riding around the city, you know what they have on their shuttle bus? Howard University, home to the most Peace Corps volunteers in the HBCU community. And the Peace Corps is nothing, is, is the, the only difference to compare the Peace Corps to the CIA, the difference between them is the difference between the Ku Klux Klan and the White Citizens Council. So the fact that in 2021, Howard is sending our babies to the Peace Corps, sending our babies to the United States Agency for International Development, sending our babies to the Pentagon. During Colin Powell's tenure on the Board of Trustees, he used that position at Howard to make sure that ROTC was back on every HBCU in the country. So if the students are, and so the biggest fear always at Howard University is those students may be protesting roaches, protesting rats, protesting stale lunches, protesting stale dinners. But after conversations with some of us, those protests could turn into saying USAID off of Howard's campus, Pentagon off of Howard's campus, CIA off of Howard's campus, especially since they're gravitating to some of the freedom fighters that they say they're part of. Howard University is a microcosm of our community. There's a part of Howard that Malcolm Maurice Bishop on campus welcomed Robert Mugabe on campus, welcomed Akme Sekou Toure on campus, welcomed Haile Selassie on campus. But there's another part of the campus that made Colin Powell comfortable, that makes the CIA comfortable, that makes the Pentagon comfortable, that makes ruthless Fortune 500 companies comfortable. As a matter of fact, my dad told me when he was there completing his doctorate, the person who was teaching Southern African history was a member of RENAMO the CIA mercenary unit that was set up to overthrow Samora Marshall and Free Limo in Mozambique. And for those of you who embrace the amputated narrative of the African experience, guess what? If you didn't know, when you wanted to be a guerrilla in the Mozambican struggle, you had to escape to Tanzania for training. They patterned their escape route after looking at the Underground Railroad. In case you don't feel you have a connection, that's why we did a play called Araminta and Samora liberating the oppressed, treating the sick, because Samora Marshall, before he was president of Mozambique, he was a nurse. So men can be nurses, and his middle name was Moises. That's how you say Moses in Portuguese. So all we're saying to all our friends, all our contemporaries, whether it's the author Jelani Cobb, whether it's ta Coates, who is teaching there now, whether it's my childhood friend, the internationally acclaimed journalist Erica blount Denoir who interviewed Comandante Fidel Castro, whether it's Mayor Raz Baraka, whether it's his sister Maria Jones, a co-founder of the Mass Emphasis Children's and History of Theater Company, whether it's the attorney Donald Temple, we have to sit down and talk about how Howard University is being used to promote 
a genocidal foreign policy, a genocidal Africa policy. And if the students are ready to protest that, we've got to have their back. Because when it's all said and done, we shouldn't tell them to be fighting against things that and fighting for things that we're not fighting for. So it's going to take a fighter already fighting to tell them to join the fight. So it's never about criticizing them, but always challenging them. And we speak from experience. When we were their age, when there's a building on Howard's campus the UDC used to own called Miners Teachers College, the Howard bought back. In that building, ooh, in that building in 1992, we um, organized a press conference to give the Libyans an opportunity to respond to the false claims that they blew up a Pan Am plane. So we were, so even though we were young and we've all, when the worldwide African anti-Zionist front created in Libya in 1990, those meetings used to be at Howard University. We've got a track record of doing work up there. We've been doing work up there. Mass Emphasis Children's History and Theater Company has performed eight plays at Howard University. My father's homegoing celebration was at the infamous Rankin Chapel. So we're no strangers to the campus, but we're saying that the time has come to challenge the students as they're gravitating to a more militant approach to life itself to take on issues that reflect that. And bring this back to Cuba, 15 years ago, that Bunch Center, a, a comrade of ours in the All African People's Revolutionary Party, and he'll verify this, named Dr. John Trimble, he took 15 students to Cuba, Sister Tyranny. You know what the Bunch Center did? They found the names of the students, had a secret meeting with them, and gave them a list of people in Cuba to meet with, which means they already had people planted in Cuba working with the U.S. government to plan the type of demonstrations that you're starting to see in Cuba right now, as early as 15 years ago. Before that, Oh, right around that time, we were doing work with the chapter of the American Medical Students Association on Howard's campus. The president was a beautiful sister named Dr. Wanda Guy Craft. And they, went, they had a seminar on World AIDS Day, giving the Cuban diplomats a chance to come and talk about their work uh, to eradicate AIDS in the world as they have the lowest HIV AIDS rate in the Americas. And at that time, it was not too long after Comandante Fidel Castro said if the resources were ever available, Cuba would deploy 4,000 doctors to Mother Africa to stay in Africa until AIDS was done away with. They would fight HIV AIDS the way they fought Batista, fight HIV AIDS the way we fought, we had 300 rebellions in Cuba, so on and so on. And now these are the medical students on the campus. They did not, they couldn't find a room in the chemistry building and the biology building or any of the other buildings that medical students are. They couldn't find a room to have this program. But in the main room in the Bunch Center, that was the room that was available. So it's self safe to say that intelligence agents filmed our seminar that day. So that's the type of activity that's going on at Howard University. It's been going on. It's, I remember also, oh man, um, the MDC, the regime change agents that were set up to overthrow the Zimbabwean government, they've, we caught them having a meeting at Howard with the Zimbabwe desk of the Voice of America. So yes, there's a Howard that's connected to the revolution, but there's a Howard connected to neocolonialism. There's a Howard connected to neoliberalism. There's a Howard connected to some of the most fascist genocidal activity that Africans have been subjected to. And the students, in the name of the people they admire, in the names of the people that professors like Greg Carr are teaching them about, it's time for them to let Howard know that Howard isn't big enough for both of those subcultures. It's either got to embrace the subculture synonymous with our resistance, or it's got to embrace the fascist, white supremacist, conquerors, and let's just let everything sort itself out. So that is our challenge to not only Howard students, but that is our challenge, especially to our contemporaries who may not be politically active anymore, but whenever they see students protesting at Howard, they get back in fight mode at least for 34 days, at least for 15 days, at least for 15 minutes. 
but they're not equipped to challenge the students to take on the most defining issues of this historical moment, because unfortunately, at this moment in history, they are no longer on the front line. All right, understood. Um, so I want to switch gears. Obviously, there's a lot going on over in Eritrea and Ethiopia. You made a good point when I was talking to you on the phone about the fact that the narrative is kind of pushing Eritrea to the side and focusing on Ethiopia. But Eritrea obviously is a country that has fought the good fight and is very dear to African liberation. So can you speak more about that conflict in specific, specifically? One of the biggest compliments I get is when I'm walking down the streets in Washington, D.C., and people come up to me and start speaking in Myrick, thinking I'm Eritrean. It happens all the time. Uh, we've been working with the Eritrean since 1991. We're not new to this at all. As a matter of fact, if you know the catalog of the Mass Emphasis Children's History and Theater Company, the only other, the only adult play I've ever written and I'm ever going to write it's called Guerrillas, Mothers, and Wives, and it's about the Eritrean women, because 33% of their guerrilla fighters were women. Very special to us. So the fact that at this historical moment, they're the only country in Mother Africa to offer free education, to offer free health care, we feel a sense of obligation to defend them. Well, Saje for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah taught us Waging resistance in liberated territory takes precedence even over waging resistance in a quest for liberation and contested territory. Very important to know, very important to understand, very important to accept. So we say that to say that because we um, embrace that position, we know that engaging the full spectrum of thought in our community, others may not embrace that, but we try to see where we can put our heads together once again, we have to thank you, our young sister, for helping us organize that meeting between the National Union of Eritrean Women a couple of months ago and uh, women organizers all over the diaspora. What we had, like women from five nations there and all over the United States, it was beautiful. And remember, they were some people who came on with the disrespectful and graphic uh, <laughs> trying to get it, trying to throw us off, trying to throw us off. So well, I'm gonna post it to the channel because yes. um, I meant to do it a while back, and I, mean, I have it saved on my computer. But yeah, it was yes, yeah. yes, and, and we need people to see that just to show you how in Eritrea, fear the fear of Eritrea by imperialism. So what ended up happening is uh, we spoke with about three weeks ago with a member of the Institute of the Black World, uh, Dr. Ron Daniels, who through a think tank it's supposed to be we don't even really know what it is it's called a pan-african unity and dialogue and you had one of their members on your show sister tyranny uh milton Ahmadi, the ugandan journalist and uh so we reached out to him he never returned our emails and never returned our calls we're not used to that but it's okay but then we said no let's talk to the boss so we said we talked to ron daniels and so we said hey we just facilitated a meeting between our brother Hillary Shelton, the NAACP's liaison to Congress, to the Senate, and to the United Nations. And he met with the Eritreans. Why are you making comments about Eritrea and you haven't even given them the courtesy of meeting with them first to confirm what is true and what is not true? And I said, we can arrange that. And he said, maybe with in a very cavalier attitude, a very distant and dismissive attitude. But we felt obligated to just warn him that we don't want this to end up like the Zimbabwe issue 15 years ago, where Trans-Africa Forum, because of their reputation, because of their visibility, thought that they could take a bunch of 30 organizers in their early 30s as a joke when we told them that being an extended mouthpiece of the Bush administration and creating an atmosphere for regime change in Zimbabwe would not be taken lightly. We'd like to resolve it diplomatically, but if not, whatever happens just has to happen. And what ended up going on is we exposed that Trans-Africa Forum was funneling money from the National Endowment for Democracy to 14 civil society groups in Zimbabwe. And so the other day, um, Dr. Daniels and his group. And also when I spoke with him, I let him know that I talked to two board members of the Institute of the Black World who claimed to never have seen this statement. 
So how is this statement out here discrediting Eritrea, discrediting Ethiopia, but your organization has not even endorsed it full circle? It's hard to be in an organization. That's the challenge. You have to be on one accord. And even though there are different levels of understanding, there's still a general understanding that people come to before they take a strategical and tactical position or an ideological position. For those of you who haven't done any real organizing, we're obligated to share with you how the process works to entice you to get some of the work in. But anyway, with that being said, so he then he told me to write some, put something in writing. I said, I'm busy just like you, if not more busy. I'm telling you now, and I'm not going to talk to you about this again. So with that being said, we're challenging Ron Daniels, Milton Ahmadi, and Don Rojas, who have been the most vocal representing the Institute of the Black World on this question. First of all, we don't want people to talk about Ethiopia and ignore Eritrea. When you look at what Eritrea represents, I'll get to that in a second. Interestingly enough, Don Rojas, and many people go through this, he's politically reinvented himself. People just know him now as an older veteran and down the Institute for the Black World. At one time, he was the Maurice Bishop, the great Pan-African freedom fighter out of Grenada, representing Grenada, New Jewel Movement, prime minister from 79 to 83, assassinated by the, US, the Reagan administration, strategically carried out by Colin Powell. He was his press secretary. So all we're saying to Don Rojas is this, with all sincerity, do you want Isaias Afwerki to end up like Maurice Bishop? And we say that to say, before you say anything about Ethiopia, anything about Eritrea, let's go back a little bit. Let's backpedal like cornerbacks on the football field. You tell us what happened to Maurice Bishop, and you then tell us how you've gotten as his press secretary to live and function in the United States. I can't imagine George Charamba, my brother, my big brother, who was the press secretary and spokesperson for President Mugabe and now has an elevated position for President Manangagwa. I can't imagine him living in the United States. I can't imagine Comandante Fidel Castro or Comandante Raul Castro or Comandante Miguel Diaz Canal's press secretary living in the United States and function. So you owe us in the spirit of transparency as people in Burkina Faso are getting full information on what happened to Thomas Sankara, a trial is going on. We need to have you come before our community on platforms like this and tell us everything that transpired with Maurice Bishop. We would be more interested in that than your opinion on Ethiopia. More important, equally as important, Ethiopia and Eritrea have fought to have this peace agreement that they finalized three years ago. They even have a task force of Ethiopian and Eritrean citizens who marched in Atlanta the other day beautifully, who are about to march in London beautifully, who are letting the United States and the European Union know you need to stay out of their business. And for those of you, once again, who, have a, who like the amputated narrative of the African experience, if you say you want peace in the streets of Chicago, you want peace in the streets of Detroit, peace in the streets of Baltimore, peace in the streets of D.C., Peace in the streets of New York amongst us? Peace in the streets of Newark where they got a serious blood crip problem? You saying you don't want peace in the streets of Asmara? Peace in the streets of Addis Ababa? What's the matter with us? And you're suggesting that these Africans in Ethiopia and Eritrea are not sophisticated enough, are not patriotic enough, are not intelligent enough to engineer that? And this, they need Washington's help and validation. They need London's help and that, that, um, validation. And the strange thing about Milton Amadi, let's get to you. You're Uganda. It was your government that you built your reputation criticizing, sir, that convinced the UN Security Council to impose sanctions on Eritrea 10 years ago under a false rumor that they were financing and harboring Al-Shabaab terrorists. When the Security Council went to Asmara, realized it was a bogus claim, it still took five years to undo. 
But the Eritrean people are so united that they they were able to do in 10 years what Cuba hasn't been able to do in 59, get their sanctions lifted. What Zimbabwe hasn't been able to do in 20, get their sanctions lifted. And they were able to get their sanctions lifted. Remember, they didn't get liberated till 1991. Tierney, you're older than Eritrea. I'm older than Eritrea. Why would we do anything to interfere with their development and their evolution as a nation? And especially from people who gave Joe Biden a passing grade his first 90 days and would probably give it to him again. Grading with a curve, to put it lightly, where the, I wish they were my teachers when I was getting bad grades in high school, grading with that type of curve to give this pig a grading a, a curve, but to be his extended mouthpiece. And since Uganda was responsible for putting Eritrea in a compromising position, how does a Ugandan like Mr. Almadi, who says he's Pan-Africanist, who says he's revolutionary and all that good stuff, what is he doing sounding like an extended mouthpiece of the Biden administration? Doesn't make any sense. And if they feel like they were backed, I told you, when I asked you privately and reached out to you, we would deal with this publicly because evidently that's what you want to do. And we're telling you, any college campus, any pool hall, any bowling alley, any radio station that you want to discuss this, we're there. But we're telling you, and that also goes for Karen Bass. You're causing a hell of a lot of confusion, lady, as the highest ranking Democrat in the Congressional International Relations Committee and sidebar, for those of you who deal with local politics, she wants to be the mayor of L.A., you all. But before she goes, she's promoting a climate for regime change in Eritrea. She had a uh, she was on a, a panel a few months ago with the president of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, chairing the African who's the chair of the African Union at the moment. And they were saying that she was saying that she met with some Ethiopians who were calling for military intervention, but she's against that. Since then, there's been additional sanctioning on Eritrea, and she supports it. But she just was in Eritrea three years ago showing support for the peace process. And who were these, er these Ethiopians you met with that want military intervention? It was the TPLF, because the Biden administration is backing them, just like they always back violent, impatient, reactionary forces on the ground in any country that they can't control. They're angry with the Ethiopian government because they're sticking to the peace agreement and they won't go for regime change because they have an Oromo leader. If you know the politics of Ethiopia, the Oromo people have always felt disempowered. They tried to assassinate this brother a few years ago, the same day they tried to assassinate President Monangagwa in Zimbabwe. They are so angry at him. He got the Nobel Peace Prize, which President F. Worky should have shared. But President F. Worky is one of those people. He doesn't need your validation. He's a humble man. If you realize right now, everybody who's incurring the wrath of imperialism has a problem with USAID. They overthrew Evo Morales in Bolivia because he said they don't need to be anywhere in the Americas. They've turned it up on Cuba because Cuba said the same thing. They've turned it up on Comrade Maduro in Venezuela because he said the same thing. They hate Putin because he threw them out of Russia. But before all of that, Afwerki threw them out of Eritrea in 2005, showed them the door. And this is an organization that was created in 61, just like the Peace Corps. And if you, it sounds familiar with you, Stanley Ann Durham, President Obama's Caucasian mother was a member of it. That's what she was doing, hanging out in Indonesia in the 1960s and what have you. So as young people at Howard and young people at Spelman and young people all over our community under the guise of black excellence are being recruited into that organization, we're saying come home and fight against them. They are in 2021 what the CIA was during the Cold War what the FBI's International Terrorist Division wants to become. They are a vicious, reactionary, barbaric organization, and they masquerade as a humanitarian aid agent. That's what makes them dangerous, and they're very powerful. They determine what African countries mayors do sister cities with. They determine what investors from Africa come here and become part of the Corporate Council on Africa. That's who Eritrea showed the door because of their boldness 
because of their vision, because of their integrity. And Eritrea has earned our respect. So if you want to do what Ron Daniels is doing, if you want to do what Milton Amadi is doing, if you want to do what Don Rojas is doing, that's fine. But just know that Africans are going to come out of the woodworks and check you. Respectfully, though, no expletives, no insults, but you're going to get taken to school. You're going to get embarrassed. And any positive accolades you've earned for your service, you are in threat of losing them. Do not be an extended mouthpiece of the Biden administration. Yank that sweet tooth for white liberals out your mouth. Not good for you. Not good for us. All right. So I want to switch gears. You had an update for us um, about President em President Emerson Mnangagwa. Do I say his name right? Um, I'm a I'm a <laughs> but um, an update about, I guess he was, uh, just came back from a UN meeting. Can you fill us in on that? Of course, uh, brother. Obi. The cop, the cop 26 meeting in Glasgow, Scotland. He came out strong. He met with Boris Johnson, which was the first meeting between a Zimbabwean head of state and a British head of state since president Mugabe met with Tony Blair in Edinburgh in 1997. He met with them on his own terms, strong, with backbone, and he could do that because the United Nations just had a special repertoire in Zimbabwe in the middle of um, November who said that, this, no, in October, I'm sorry, who said the sanctions on Zimbabwe should be lifted, a diplomatic victory. The Committee for Sustainable Development, which Zimbabwe chaired in 2007, said they want to come in and help Zimbabwe with its SDGs because it's obvious when you see their, their educational ministry, when you see their healthcare ministry, when you see their agricultural ministry, ministry, they are committed to their people's destiny, which means that nobody can ever again say that Zimbabwe deserves LDC status. For your listeners who don't know what that means, that's least developed country status, when you basically surrender your economy to the United Nations and you admit you're, too in, you're not competent enough to manage your own money to manage your economic direction. And of the 55 nations that are in LDC status right now, 35 of them, unfortunately, are in Mother Africa. But Zimbabwe is not going to be on that list. So they've had, and Zimbabwe's had a lot of victories, which I never have talked about um, as I've appeared. This is my fourth time, but I'll go over them real quickly. In 2007, they got to chair the Committee for Sustainable Development at the UN, even though the US and Britain try to block them. In 2008, they tried to get the Security Council to impose additional sanctions, but China and, v China and Russia vetoed it. In 2006, they tried to get Zimbabwe, the late Donald Payne, who was the Congressional Black Caucus's expert on African affairs, they tried to pressure Zimbabwe to accept LDC status. Zimbabwe said sanctions are responsible for our economic challenges. In 2011, 12, Zimbabwe chaired the, the United Nations World Tourism Organization Summit, and the world got to see how beautiful it is, how organized they are, and realized that a lot of the things that they've heard, that the uh, U.S. State Department's alert that non-essential travel to Zimbabwe should be deferred due to political violence, they realized that all of that was myth, all of that was rumor, all of that was innuendo. In 2005, the ambassador to the food and the UN Food and Agriculture uh, Organization, the U.S. one, Tony Hall, tried to block President Mugabe from addressing the meeting. The same weekend, the same Saturday, that um, you had the 10th anniversary of the Million Man March. And if you go back and look at the Washington Times, October 19th, I believe it was, of 2005, President Mugabe's on the forefront calling Blair and Bush the world's greatest terrorist. And then you have the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan on the right-hand side where they covered the march. So um, Zimbabwe has enjoyed a lot of victories at the United Nations. We're still pushing for the sanctions to be lifted. They've never declared perfection. And we're just about that fight. And we're about addressing any rumors about them. The land reclamation project is strong. The, um, their work in dealing with cholera is strong. They're still re rebounding from the devastating cyclone. And... What this shows Africans is, once again, don't let outsiders' language become your language. And we do that when we lack the context and we lack the history. 
So whenever Al Gore comes to you talking about climate change, you told him that the only climate ch change we're interested in is the social climate. We want to end globe poverty in Africa. We want to end genocide in Africa. We want to end exploitation in Africa. We want to end imperialism from feeling they can sanction who they want, when they want, how they want. That's the climate change we're interested in. And when we've changed the social climate, then we'll deal with meteorology. Then we'll deal with air quality index. Then we'll deal with rainfall. But until we have changed the social climate, until we are united, until we're liberated, until we're socialist, our work does not stop. And yes, we're socialists because the other thing that we have to deal with and we gain inspiration from Cuba, Zimbabwe and Eritrea and places like that, not, our comrades, they are not politically insecure. We fight for what we fight for. We stand for what we stand for. I remember being invited to a rites of passage conference. 80% of the students that went through it were my African history students. And they called me the night before and told me not to talk about socialism because they usually don't invite socialists to their platform. And I told them, I love you till I die. And they said, why do you say it like that? I said, you don't know it. You paid me the ultimate compliment. What you just told me is that Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah couldn't have come to your meeting. You just told me Ahmed Sekou Toure couldn't have come to your meeting. That Thomas Sankara couldn't come to your meeting. That Emilcar Cabral couldn't come to your meeting. That Samora Marshall couldn't come to your meeting. That France Fanon couldn't come to your meeting. That Kwame Toure couldn't come to your meeting. That Mukasa Dada couldn't come to your meeting. So Africans, they want one unified socialist Africa. None of them, Muammar Gaddafi, or you wouldn't have let him come because he got Arab blood anyway. So he couldn't come anyway. And the thing is, as we're looking to intensify class struggle, we recognize, Sister Tyranny, that some of us have a selfish love for Africa. They love Africa, but not enough to share it with you and me. They want all the gold. They want all the diamonds. They want all the copper. They want all the uranium. They'd rather be like Mansa Musa than Modibo Keita in Mali if they chose. They'd rather be like Samori Toure, even though he was a fighter, but they'd rather be like him than Akme Sekou Toure. They'd rather be like Yah Santwa than be like Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. So the lines are clear and we understand that, but we love Africa so much that we're willing to share it with every African because it inherently belongs to you. And as Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah said, you're not an African because you were born in it, whether or not you were born in Africa, you're an African because Africa was born inside of you. So whether you were born in Cleveland, whether you were born in Denver, whether you were born in Alabama, whether you were born in Cuba, whether you were born in Panama, whether you were born in Australia, whether you were born in India, it's yours. Now, whether you're going to fight for it, that's up to you. Whether you're going to die for it, that's up to you. But if you look in the face of our children, we know you'll do the right thing. When you look in the face of our women, you'll do the right thing. When you look in the face of the men of character amongst us, you'll do the right thing. We never lose confidence in you. So every time we come here, we're going to share updates of service, but we're going to challenge you to stop spreading confusion. And we're going to challenge you to embrace the most difficult obstacles we face, the ones that build character. And that's what we're doing. And so um, for the people who and so we wanted to clear up the, the stuff with Cuba. We wanted to clear up Eritrea. We wanted to reaffirm our support to Zimbabwe. And we'll close by saying this very soon, and we'll be back on to promote it properly. You're familiar with the Mass Emphasis Children's History and Theater Company by now. You're familiar with the Mass Emphasis, Mass Emphasis Positive Action and Creativity Youth Brigade by now, which has the following projects to its name, a visual mixtape on Kwame Ture, a video by a young man, 19 at the time, now 21, who wanted to bring attention to Cuba's and Venezuela's efforts to eradicate blindness. Uh, that same 21-year-old with a 16-year-old and a 20-year-old did a documentary on the Henry Reeve Medical Brigade. That's the, those are the type of projects that, they, that you're going to do when you pull children into that. And um, the next one, the next dimension of mass emphasis is called the Mass Emphasis Children's History and Educational Navigation Institute. And that's gonna be an online class in the community on Saturdays for children. 
one class for children nine through 12, one class for children um, 13 and up. And we're going to start that the first weekend of January. And we've been teaching for 31 years. We have a lot of techniques. We have a lot of tricks. We have a lot of tools. We have a lot of skills. And we offer them to African children all over the diaspora. We're not coming on here to talk. We can't see the chats, but we have a sense of humor. We know that nine times out of 10, a significant portion of the chats don't have anything to do with what we're talking about. But that makes sense because if you're not willing to fight for these things, you shouldn't be talking about them no way. But if you are at least uh, interested, if you're curious, if you're willing to explore, you know we're always here. At Junior Egbuna, J-R-E-G-B-U-N-A is the Twitter. At Obi Egbuna, O B I E G B U N A 15 is the Instagram. The email is Obi Egbuna 15 at gmail.com. For the Cuba information, hashtag Cuban blockade in humane, hashtag get out of Cuba way. And um, this is the type of interview because this is what people tell me. They appreciate them when they go back and listen to them versus how they sound live because we could sound a little bit intense. We could sound a little bit militant, but when you slow it down, you'll catch what we were trying to propagate and transmit. We're that confident in your intellect. So thank you so much, Sister Tyranny, for always um, offering this platform to us. And one more thing before I go. Some of these other platforms out here, let them grow. Let them develop. Let them evolve. They're not obligated to have us on there. They could do what they want. They can invite who they want, and it's perfectly okay. They don't have to have us on there. We have enough platforms available to us. It's our task to utilize them. And you're only going to see us on platforms when we're talking about the latest phase of our labor and our service, because that's what organizers do. So if there are other platforms that are more geared, more fashioned, more tailored, more designed to the opinions and the viewpoints of the social critic and the casual commentator. We're as comfortable knowing there as a rat surrounded by a fortress of cats. Not for us, no way. You know what I mean? So deal with that how you may. But we wish, but shout out to all the platforms that are trying to take us from pro, from, from protest to resistance and are trying to take us from victimization to resistance and are trying to take us from mobilization to organization. We love you even if you don't love us. See, that's why I love having Brother Obi on. He closes out the uh, interview for me, so I don't have to do it. Um, <laughs> but thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Um, thank you again, Brother Obi, for another great interview. I'm sure I'll be going back and uh, soaking in this information. So everyone, please, again, follow Brother Obi. He's on Twitter. He dropped his email. I'm also going to put it inside of a comment. Um, oh, gosh. And with that, I'm going to actually log and out. Your, and, your show, and your show is growing. I can't even go outside in my neighborhood. And I live in Hyattsville, Maryland. And people are telling me I saw you on Tyranny Show. That's happened like 10 times uh, this last year. So your uh, show is growing. <laughs> your show is growing and you are so deserving because you work so hard. And congratulations with everything you're doing with We Charge Colonialism. Congratulations with your work with the National Conference of Black Lawyers um, and any other collective vehicles that are empowered because you're contributing to them. You're one of the strong young ones out here. We're just honored to know you and work with you. Salute to you. Thank and on you. that note, as we hold up our two beautiful children, I think it's time to go. All right. Thank you, everyone. That's why, that's why we'll show his face. Not many people see him. There, Mosiah. He's Hi, three Mosiah. years old. <laughs> He pretends to be shy. <laughs> and I and I gotta perform the function of a change. It's like that. <laughs> so we'll talk to y'all later. Y'all right, be strong. Thank you, Thank you, African. All right. Thank you.